Welcome to those of you who are joining us for this evening's conversation. My name's Oriel Miller, really pleased that you're all, um, you're all with us. It's the first time we've done an event, a virtual event uh, this time of day, so um, great to have you with us. Thanks very much indeed for, for joining. Um, and lovely to see so many members we've not seen for a while too. Just a quick reminder on housekeeping. Uh, we're gonna be keeping to an hour. Participants are muted as you come into the room. The hashtag is hashtag rejuvenating Wales. Uh, the session is being recorded and the chat is being recorded too. If you would like to ask a question to Jerry a bit later on, please do let our moderator Andy know and we'll come to you so that you can ask it directly. Um, we suggest also that uh, you have your view on speaker view to get the best uh, to get the best experience. It makes a, for a better video too afterwards if you're watching it on playback. Um, we have um, a really great mix of people joining us this evening. So do please say hello to each other in the in the chat at the side as well and introduce yourself to, to others. Um, we deliberately wanted to hold this as a, as a meeting rather than a webinar so that everybody could see each other. Um, and obviously we're not able to meet up in person as we would like to yet. So let's get started. Uh, tonight's discussion is outside the framework of our ongoing policy and project work and outside of our debates and rethinking Wales sessions with panelists from different sectors. Tonight we have a single speaker, so it's a one-off event, a bit like the man himself, and it's a great pleasure to be introducing uh, and hosting Professor Jerry Holtham this evening. Jerry needs no introduction to many of you with us uh, tonight, but for those of you who may be new to the IWA, Jerry is Managing Partner of Cadron Capital LLP and Hodge Professor of Regional Economy at Cardiff Metropolitan University. He served as a member of the then Welsh Assembly Government's Economic Research Advisory Panel and chaired the Independence Commission on Funding and Finance for Wales. He's also been a trustee of the IWA for a grand total of over 19 years. And we wanted to mark this appropriately and thank him for his long service and substantial contribution to our board and policy discussions. I've greatly enjoyed working with Jerry over the last four and a half years, honing my debating skills at our board meetings. And while he may be stepping down from the board, I'm sure that this is by no means the end of his long and happy relationship with the organisation. So I wanted, first of all, Jerry, to say a very public thank you for everything that you've done and for all that you've contributed. At, uh, at the IWA, we have been increasingly focused on economic policy work over the last five years, whether it's our Re-Energising Wales project, which explored how an ambitious zero carbon target could become an economic strategy, or our new project, looking at how we can strengthen Wales's foundation economy. Our commitment is to contribute to a successful, clean, green, and above all, fair economy. Fairness should be the common denominator of all other economic objectives. For instance, the low carbon transition must bring wealth back into our communities, not extract it. The foundational economic agenda must be rooted in placemaking, in fair work and in sustainability, as well as growth. But there is one other aspect of fairness which is often neglected or just paid lip service to within, within economic policy making. And that's the extent to which the economy seems increasingly unfair to younger people. As Jerry will set out, younger people are less optimistic about their economic future and having security in their old age than older people. They often feel compelled to leave the places they've grown up just to find the jobs they want or to be able to buy a home. This then contributes to the hollowing out of Welsh towns and indeed cities as so many young people leave Wales entirely. There's often an implicit assumption that this is something, simply something that young people want, to leave the place that they've grown up for a far bigger place for the nightlife, for a wider range of intellectual, cultural, sporting or shopping opportunities. Some of you may remember our event in Swansea a few years ago called Shall I Stay or Shall I Go? When we asked young people from three different local colleges what their hopes and dreams were. We learned that even if young people already lived in a city, they weren't necessarily aware of everything on offer there. They weren't sure how the cultural life of their city was being planned and they didn't know how they could feed their thoughts into this planning to shape it. So we must be careful not to treat young people as a homogenous group who will want the same thing. The decision to leave their homes, friends and families to move to bigger cities will not always be a positive one, but maybe something they feel compelled to do because the opportunities aren't there in the places that they would rather live. And even if they do find work, that work is more likely to be precarious, temporary, 
insecure and low paid than it would have been for previous generations. Two thirds of the growth in employment since 2008 has been in atypical roles, such as self-employment, zero hours contracts or agency work. And it's another aspect of life in Wales where the pandemic has made a prior trend much worse with the worrying UK wide figure that 88% of COVID related job losses are affecting people under 35 years old. With research by Craig Berry and Sean McDaniel of Manchester Metropolitan University, young people view this precarity of employment as a highly unfair new normal. They also view it as something which is here to stay. For an organization like the IWA, where we're all about positive change, the idea that a whole generation views their economic prospects as simultaneously unfair and immutable is a deeply sobering one. So we need to recognize that this is very much a political problem. Older people are more likely to vote and to have social and economic capital to expend on engaging in political processes. Retail politics has a lot to offer them as a voting bloc. However, as Wales leads the way on lowering the voting age, it'd be fascinating to see to what extent younger voters will change the marketplace of ideas, shaping the outcome of not just this election, but those to come. Democratic involvement of young people must go far beyond voting reform. When a 16 year old votes for the first time next month, that we hope should be the beginning of a journey of routine involvement and engagement in the decisions that affect their lives, not their last chance to feel heard for another five years. We have some considerable way to go on this ambition. We should of course acknowledge that older people are also not a homogenous group. There's deep economic inequality within all age cohorts and pensioner poverty is a cruel reality for many in Wales. We should never seek to pit generations against each other. Indeed, many older people share the fears younger generations have. They want to worry that their grandchildren's future will be wor worse than the lives that they have had. There can be no greater economic failing for any society. But there are many reasons for optimism too. The world of work has changed. And the opportunities for young people in Wales to have good and relatively secure work will not necessarily need to sit within the sectors that have historically powered our economy. The economic future for young people in Wales could be as individual points in a global network. From behind a laptop in Bridgend, Brecon, Bangor and Baglan, young people could be working globally while remaining rooted in the places they grew up, contributing economically and socially to their communities and nation. This is just one potential vision of the future, of course. But if we focus too heavily on trying to tempt big firms into Wales to bring in jobs in high volumes, we risk solving yesterday's problem and not recognizing that the world has changed. The big question tonight is, has, Wales, has policy in Wales kept pace with these rapid changes to the labor market and how can it catch up? We need the right investment in skills, infrastructure and innovation, particularly in digital. We also need to reimagine and redesign our towns and as places where young people can stay and prosper. In a moment, Jerry will set out some proposals for policies that could play a part in this change. And we'll be thinking about what we at the IWA to, could contribute, could do to contribute to bring new ideas to the table. After Jerry's presentation, we'll share a link in the chat to a very short do poll, which is your chance to suggest what we should focus on. We'll also be doing a live poll during the event on which of Jerry's ideas you think we should be the priority. However, it would be remiss of me not to take a moment just to invite us all to take a look at our own screens and notice the demographics of us as a group. Who is contributing to and hearing this discussion? I'm sure you would all agree that young people need to not just be part of these conversations, but driving them. And that's why we at the IWA have been taking steps to open ourselves up to new voices and insights. And we recognize we need to do even more to engage young people in our work. Indeed, our members, you told us so at our 2019 AGM. We're delighted that our young persons membership category has grown considerably in the last few years. And we're pleased to be involved in both the East and WEN Wales mentoring schemes, as well as championing new young writers with important perspectives and suggestions to share. We think this needs to happen at a root and branch level across all organizations who design and influence policy, with spaces ma made and held for young people's voices to be heard and listened to. Now, that's enough for me as an opener. I'm going to now hand over to Jerry, 
who's going to share his screen and talk to us about his vision for rejuvenating Wales. Jerry, over to you. Okay, so um, uh, the first screen is a picture by um, uh, James Dixon Innes, and it's called uh, Deep, uh, Deep Twilight uh, in the, I won't tell you what the mountains are, Deep Twilight, uh, and I think that's what we've got to avoid. Ha can you now see my second slide? Yep. Okay. We're fine. Um, the point I was making was the, the ambitions for Wales in terms of raising our growth rate sustainably so that we, we converge on income per head in the rest of the UK and uh, improving our budgetary position at the same time so that we are um, not uh, quite so dependent on, the, um, uh, on Westminster is really very difficult when you look at this. We are an old country and we are getting older. This is the proportion of people um, uh, over 65 co compared with the numbers of people in the age range 16 to 64. Now, those aren't ideal as, as, um, as age ranges because few people go to work at 16 these days and um, most people are gonna work past 65 as well. But these are um, the categories in which the data is arranged. So I've just taken them. I haven't attempted to reshape it. And you can see that we've gone from uh, having nearly four people for every person who's retired uh, in a roughly working age back in 91 to a situation at the moment where there are you know, three people or um, uh, and we're going to get to a, to a position by 2040 where there are only just over two people in work for every person who is uh, uh, of retirement age. And that's a projection, but unfortunately it's a pretty safe projection because everybody who's going to be in the labor force in 2040 is, is alive now. So this doesn't depend on birth rates, which are always hard to project. It just depends on death rates, which uh, unfortunately are rather easy to project. So we know this is true. We know it's going to happen, that we're going to be in a situation, unless we do something, where there are, are barely two people employed for every person who's elderly. And of course, this is a problem that isn't, uh, isn't uniform. If you look across Wales, you see that actually Cardiff isn't too bad. Uh, there is, um, can you see an arrow on the screen or not? Anybody, anybody answering? Arrow, arrow? Uh, well, anyway, if you look, if you look at this, uh, you can see Cardiff is uh, two thirds of the way across and the proportion of over 65s there is under 15%. It's under 20% in most of the urban, main urban areas in Newport, for example, at the end there, it's, uh, it's around 17, 18%. In Swansea, it's creeping up to 20. In Wrexham, it's at 20. But if you want to be over 25, you've got to go to Conwy, uh, Powys, and, and Monmouthshire, the rural areas of Wales, where, where the problem is already more acute. Uh, and this has, of course, implications for those areas and indeed for Welsh language culture, apart from anything else. So we've got a problem, and it's a particular problem in rural areas. Um, now, we were saying that when the young decline and the elderly increase, you're going to get some bumps in the road if you're trying to increase your growth rate or do anything like that. So what could be done? Uh, this is just more or less repeating what I've just said, that in, um, in, uh, in 2040, we'll have little more than two people of working age compared with, with, the, with the working population. Um, this is gonna make growth difficult. Uh, social care and health costs are likely to rise as a proportion of income, making it very difficult to reduce the fiscal gap and for Wales to pay its way. And there's just a wrinkle for which I'm partly responsible, I'm afraid. The adjusted Barnett formula actually penalizes Wales if population growth is slower than in England. Uh, we put a fix into the Barnett formula, which you may or may not remember, which puts a floor under the, under the Welsh allocation. But part of the price for that was a formula whereby the, um, 
the actual grant is reduced for your tax base. But the way that uh, formula works, if, if our population grows more slowly than England, it will have the effect of reducing the block, uh, the block grant, other things being equal. It's only a small effect, but it's there. So altogether, um, the, the wind is in our face. Now, if you look at migration statistics, migrations actually helped population growth in Wales over the last couple of decades. Uh, between 2001 and the present day, um, population in Wales has risen by about 280,000 people, an annual growth rate of just over half a percent a year, which is very respectable for a developed uh, country. And of that 280,000, 107,000 was net immigration. So the rate of immigration wasn't high, 0.3% of the population annually, but it contributed a total of 38% of total population growth over this period. Uh, that's going to come to an end. The projections are that, that the Welsh population will cease to grow at all in the mid 2020s. And although, the although migration has helped to sustain population growth in Wales, it hasn't done much for the distribution of population by age. And this chart shows why. If you look at the migration that's occurred by age group, uh, you'll see that um, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six uh, bars there. The final bar is just the total. Um, the main migration has come from people in middle age or late middle age, 45 to 64. Uh, there's even some net migration of over 65s, presumably just retiring to Wales. Uh, they brought their kids with them because there's this positive migration in the 0 to, to 14 uh, age range. But we've, we're losing 30,000 kids a year in, the, well, I say kids, in the, in, the, in the range 15 to 29. So we're, Wales loses young people uh, in the late teens and 20s. Now, maybe some of those are coming back. Maybe they're coming back when they're 45, 64, but it would make a big difference if we could hang on to those people. And the risk of sounding a little brutal, uh, we don't particularly want to encourage immigration of over 65s. Now, I've nothing against old timers. In fact, people tell me I'm one myself. But, uh, you know, I think as a matter of public policy, uh, that, that should be the sort of hard-headed attitude. So the practical question is, can we change the character of these migration flows? Can we keep more of our own young people in Wales? Can we retain students who come here for university courses from elsewhere in the UK? And can we improve social care in Wales without encouraging more people to move here at, at, towards the end of their lives? And I think to do all of those things requires tilting a whole range of public policies in favor of the young. Now, I'm going to repeat some of the points that Oriel made at the beginning of the session. I think this isn't only shrewd as a matter of hard-nosed public uh, sort of policy, if you're trying to improve the economy and the state of the, uh, of the public finances, it's also fair because um, one can't say that the kids have had it very easy in the last, in the last you know, decade or two. If you look at owner occupation, it's now falling in the UK. We used to pride ourselves, rightly or wrongly, on the fact that our owner occupation rate was much higher than in continental countries like Germany or France. Well, we're now heading down to very much the same sort of levels as them. Uh, it, takes, it, it takes millennials an average of 19 years to save for a deposit for a home compared to three years in the 1980s. And this is uh, largely a consequence of what's happened to the relative cost of house, of housing, the relative size of house prices and wages. Uh, house prices have just gone out of, out of control compared to wages and, and that ratio has made it very difficult uh, for young people to, to own a home. 
Access to, to, to defined benefit pensions has also dried up in the private sector, so the kids don't, don't have the same sense of security that some of their elders might have had. And this has been going on for some time. Um, people born in the 1970s, by their early 30s, that's in the, in the, they're back in the early noughties now, had accumulated nearly double the average wealth that people born in the 1980s, so who were coming up to 30 in around 2010, uh, when they, they seven, those in the 70s had double the wealth of those who were born in the 80s when they reached that, that age of about 30. Um, and of course, we know that higher education carries a substantial debt burden for um, now. Many students graduate with certainly 30,000, in some cases, 50,000 pounds worth of, uh, of debt. Job security, as Oriel has mentioned, has, uh, has increased. And none of this looks like improving. None of this has started to improve more recently. In fact, the Great Recession of 2008 and the pandemic of 2020, as Oriel also mentioned, have made matters still worse. This is a very bad time to be joining the world of work. And unfortunately, there's a lot of evidence that uh, people have analyzed age cohorts and they find if you join the, if you join the labor force at a time of recession, your, your annual salary or your lifetime salary never recovers relative to people who, who, join, the, who join the labor force in a period of boom. So altogether, I don't think um, we need have any compunction about tilting the policy in favor of the young. Um, they haven't had it easy up to now. And so for that reason, it isn't any wonder that, that they are, again, as Oriel mentioned, uh, hey, he's kept stealing my thunder, Oriel, in a big way. But anyway, um, here we are. This is, um, uh, this is a survey. It's quite old now, 2017. but. Um, uh, the work by the Resolution Foundation hasn't found any change. Uh, this survey, which was quite an extensive one conducted across the UK, asked people whether they were pessimistic or optimistic about their financial security as they got older, and asked them by age group. And what you see is that people 18 to 24 that don't believe they're going to get older. You know, they're not going to get older, so they don't even think about it. But once you get past that very early group, uh, the older you are, the more optimistic you are about your old age. And um, the, 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 uh, uh, the orange bars show pessimism, and that's highest in the 25, 34, 34, uh, 35, 44 area. People just getting to the point where they start to worry about it, and they worry about it much more than older people do. So, so that's the situation, and I think we, if we could do something to reassure those people, it would certainly help them to help them help them to uh, uh, to decide Wales is a good place to live. So, what can we do about it? Um, I think the first thing to recognise is the Welsh government is extremely strapped for cash. You know, post post. Uh, um, COVID, once the UK government turns the spending tap off, which I can tell you they're going to do in a big way, the first chance they get, and with Brexit continuing to bite, um, the prospects for public expenditure in Wales are not great. So there's no getting away from it. You can't duck it. If you're going to do a lot of things for, uh, for, for young people, other things are going to have to suffer. I'm, I just don't think there's an alternative. This is, this is a... This is not uh, offering a way out. This is saying we have to make some brutally difficult, difficult uh, decisions. And if we don't want to make them, we won't want to make them. But if we want to do anything about this situation, we have to make them. And I think what that means is we have to spend more on education and training. And that probably means we cannot meet our aspirations for health and social care. The Welsh government is currently spending over 50% of its budget on health and social care, about 48% on health alone. And it is a bottomless pit. You can spend as much as you want and then some more. So we just have to make some decisions about what we are and are not going to do. Very difficult politically, but I don't think there's a, there's a sort of hidden pot of money somewhere that we can use for other policies without making hard decisions. Now we've talked about how we better social care, and I think in this context, I would argue very strongly that any care levy that the British government 
sorry, the Welsh government brings in in order to finance a higher standard of social care, and nobody denies that that's required. Uh, um, there are, social care is not adequate, and it's it's quite uh, um, heavy as well on uh, the costs are heavy on 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 people who can barely afford it. So there's no argument that something should be done. Um, but any care levy that uh, that we bring in to finance that improvement, I think, has to be contributory. If you haven't paid it, you don't get all of the benefits. And so otherwise, you, if you improve social care and it's non-contributory, you're just encouraging uh, people to, to come into the Costa Geriatrica and, uh, and, you know, Welsh taxpayers will be funding even more, even more elderly immigrants. I don't think that's fair. So it's got to be contributory. If you haven't paid, you don't get everything. And it should be age-related. We must make a levy where the payments are uh, dependent on your age cohort. There's no reason, you know, we're, not, we're no longer in a situation where we can be entirely confident that we'll all be much better off in future than we are now. Not with the ecological crisis and, and other things like that. So we can't be sure that we'd be that much better off on average in 50 years time than we are now. And therefore, if you make the assumption that we're all gonna get much the same deal, why should somebody who's gonna pay in for 10 years pay in at the same rate as somebody who's gonna pay in for 40 years to get the same deal? Obviously completely unreasonable and completely unfair. And so young people should pay at a lower rate than old people. And uh, um, so I would be very insistent that, that any social care levy should be structured in that way. Now, I also think that, that that we should look at education costs. Um, the two things that are weighing down on young people are the fact they have to pay for their tertiary education and then they can't afford to buy a house. So I would make Welsh tertiary education free for everyone in Wales who's prepared to work in Wales for five years after graduation. And it doesn't matter where they come from. If they come from Lincoln and they want to, and they're prepared to stay in Wales after they finish their course at Swansea, five years and you're free three years you get half it back and and i think we have to do something like that to really um ease this burden on on the young and also encourage them to as many as possible to stay in wales and of course this shouldn't be applied purely to university education uh, we also need to expand technical education opportunities uh, working with um uh, the further education institutions and with businesses and um and uh, and make the the costs to the to the student equally equally easy in that case. I'm very conscious in saying that that there are lots of programs of uh, um, uh, partnerships for for training partnerships in different parts of Wales, and every political party is promising you know 120 125 thousand uh, apprenticeships, practically more than the leaving sort of population of the schools. Um, and, and that we're, we're all going to do wonderful things for FE. Everybody's promising this, so this is not a new suggestion or a novel suggestion. I just like them to do it rather than talk about it. Um, I also think we can be a bit, a bit um, innovative. We do know, as, as Oriol has again pointed out, that, um, that many young people are having to, or they are choosing to, or maybe having to, maybe choosing to, start their own businesses and be self-employed rather than find, find work. And I think we need to sort of acknowledge this and structure it. We need a, a fund and a mentoring service so that young people starting in business uh, can, can find cheap sources of finance and find angels who will help them to, to, um, uh, to develop the business they start. And I think you know, this needs to be done at quite a low granular level in local areas um, doesn't need to be super high tech but i think that sort of infrastructure is required to acknowledge the the sort of situation and condition of the labor market at the present time and uh, here again we can talk about uh, making uh, tertiary education free but we've also got a lot of youngish people who've already got those already got those debts they're accumulated um, I don't think we can afford to, to write off or to sort of forgive all of the student debt. Um, indeed, making tertiary education free is quite a heavy bill in Wales. I think you're going to be talking um, 
many hundreds of millions of, of, of pounds, uh, approaching a billion. So um, we certainly couldn't afford to write off existing debt, but I would commute it for people who, prepare, who are starting a business and employing other people. One of the incentives to doing that could be if, you're, if you've got student debt hanging over you and you're starting a business, you can forget the debt. What can we do about the cost of housing? Well, I think second homes should be taxed much more heavily. Um, and I don't quite understand why Wales has been so reticent about this. Um, when it was first proposed, people were accusing other people of being racist and anti-incomer. Anti um, but it's a social problem. We've got areas of Wales where a tenth, one tenth of the entire housing stock consists of second homes. That is true in Gwynedd. One in 10 houses is a second home. Uh, it's not that bad anywhere else, but the second worst area, well, it's the worst area, the second highest area for second homes is Monmouthshire. So you've got, uh, it's a social problem. It does drive up prices beyond the range of, uh, 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 of locals. Um, for a long time, local authorities weren't allowed to charge more for second homes. In fact, they tended to charge less on the grounds that the person wasn't there all the time and didn't use the services. They are now allowed to, to charge more, but not many of them are doing it, partly because there's a loophole. If I've got a second home and I declare that it's a, it's a, I'm, I'm running it as a business via Air, Airbnb or something, then um, uh, I can elect to, play, to pay um, to pay business rates instead of council tax. But I mean, that is something which the Welsh government can control. It, Welsh government has control over business rates and council tax. It could simply legislate to say, sorry, if you're running this kind of business, you're paying the same rate as the council tax, whatever that is. And by the way, councils, why don't you triple council tax? Because we're going to let you do it. And on second homes. And I think that's what's required, a, a fairly, a fairly um, condign treatment of um, of taxation of second homes. And you could use some of the money then to waive the transactions tax for first time buyers of homes and in that way attempt to both reduce house prices by taxation of second homes and make access a little bit easier by relieving the transactions tax. So I think there, there's also a very strong case for, for a reform of council tax to, um, to reduce it on low cost homes, at the moment, the tax is very unfair. Um, never mind what you're earning. If you are living in a house up in the valleys, it's worth 50 grand, you'll pay 2% of the capital value of that house every year in council tax. If your house is in Kincord and it's worth a million, you'll probably pay less than half a percent. So if you just had a flat rate that said, everybody pays 1% of the capital value, you'd halve council tax at the bottom end and you'd multiply it by three or four at the top, which is why nobody does it, because it's unpopular. But it should, nonetheless, something should be done to make it fairer, and that too would tend to, to make um, it, uh, it affordable to buy cheaper houses. Right. Um, the other things I would do are to look at the education system and the provision for nursery education and things like Sure Start Centres. I haven't costed this, but well, I. But you, we could certainly afford, for example, to say, why don't we try and get Wales back where it used to be in the 1950s and 60s, where it was, it was famous for having the best education system in the UK. Currently, we are, according to the PISA, uh, we're about the worst in the UK, or one of the worst, anyway. Um, uh, now, people talk quite rightly that uh, if you're going to improve the standard of care in care homes, you've got to pay the staff better. I think we should do the same with teachers. I think we should say to teachers, look, um, we're going to increase your pay by 10% across the board. There's going to be a Welsh uh, allowance for school teachers. And this isn't big money. This is not big money. There are about 25,000 teachers in Wales. Their average pay is between 30 and 40 grand. So, you know, give them all four grand each, it's 100 million. Now, you know, in the context of a Welsh budget of 16, 17, 18 billion, that is not a big sum of money. Uh, for giving student grants is big money, paying teachers 10% more is not. And I think it's, it's, it's got to be a bargain. We've got to realize that, that you know, teachers unions haven't been terribly, um, how can I put it, progressive in helping the Welsh government uh, 
raise standards. They've seen it as their job to try and make sure that their members are not as are not particularly accountable. I mean, after all, who wants to be accountable? If somebody's defending me, they'll try and make, try and make me unaccountable. And that's really what the unions have been doing. I think we, we've got to say, no, look, uh, we have to measure these things properly. We have to be fair. We have to treat teachers with professional respect and let them have their autonomy to do what they need to do. But then, you know, they are they are accountable for what happens. And but we've got to pay them properly if we're going to do that. So I, I would have a I would have a, a, a sort of strategic bargain with the teaching profession. Um, why don't we all try and get a lot better? And why don't we pay you more? Um, and I would at the same time uh, um, prioritize childcare and and a nursery education, things that help people when they're young and then help young families as well if they're, if they're living in Wales. So those are, my, those are my proposals. I'm very aware that they're not um, inadequate to the task. Um, and I think we all need to put our thinking caps on and think about what other things we could do to to make Wales a more attractive place for young people, uh, to encourage more young people to come and stay here and to keep, certainly to keep our own young people in the country. Thank you very much for listening. Jerry, thank you very much indeed. Um, we wanted a provocation and you've given us one. Um, there's, a, there's a load of things in there for us to, to pick our way through. I'm delighted you've got nothing against people from Lincoln coming to stay uh, and study in Swansea and stay, sticking around for, for five years uh, later on. Um, and I want to uh, just tee up our audience uh, this evening because we're going to give you an opportunity uh, now to give you to give some immediate feedback on what you've just heard. So in a moment, hopefully, if the tech gods are on our side this time around, a poll will pop up on your screens listing the policy ideas that, that Jerry has just set out. And we'd like you, please, to be the ones to make what, what uh, Jerry calls some brutally difficult decisions. Um, we'd like you to choose which, if any, of Jerry's ideas you would prioritise if you were the next Welsh Government Economy Minister. Uh, and there's also an opportunity, obviously, to submit questions to Jerry um, as well. I know a few have been coming through in the chat already. That's great. Do either use the chat room or use the um, or message Andy directly as moderator. Um, and then we will come to you to ask you to unmute yourselves and join the video to ask a question directly. We're also going to be sharing a bit of um, a link in the chat for post event feedback too. So let's, um, let's see that poll please on Jerry's ideas and give everybody in the virtual room now a chance to, to share their own thoughts on what would work. So IWA team, go to it. Okay, and I'm hoping that the poll, poll is going to pop up miraculously. Um, Rian, you may want to change who the co-host is. There we are. There we go. So you should see on your screen um, a question, and it's a, it's a single question, which of these uh, economic policies for young people would you choose? So now's your chance to do that while you are thinking of your question to ask Jerry directly. So Jerry, in a minute, we'll see we'll see the results of that in in real time. But I know that there are some um, some questions for you too, and um, I'm going to come to. I'm going to ask you in a minute um, what needs to be further fleshed out on, on the choice that people have come up with. But meantime, one of your provocations is that Wales should spend more on education and training, even if we cannot meet aspirations for social health and social care. And to put it mildly, that's pretty provocative. So is there, I just want to unpack this a bit, is there a risk that this contributes to decline in the health and social care system in the long term? And we're already looking at a very long tail of um, conditions, illnesses, uh, operations that are um, delayed because of the impact of COVID, understandably. Um, 
are is is what you mean really that when today's young people need it the quality of care that currently older people experience simply won't be available to them or is that an, and is that another way in which this generation will be worse off than those who came before um and i guess that uh, you know packed in with that there's a question around you know is this an old-fashioned view i hesitate to say this of government of both government spending that an increase in spending in one area must be matched by a cut elsewhere does it undermine the preventative and enabling role of health and social care in supporting young people particularly for instance those with disabilities to be economically active as well as being obviously healthy and happy being a very important end in itself so i guess a number of things in there what do you mean by not meeting our aspirations on health and social care? Well, um, two things. Political parties at present are tending to vie with each other in saying that they think social care should be free. You know, we, uh, uh, why can't it be like health and be, uh, be free at the point of, point of access? Because you've paid your taxes. And the answer is quite a simple answer. You haven't paid enough taxes, that's why. And unless you want to pay a lot more taxes, um, that isn't going to be possible. Uh, well, it is possible, but you know, not if you're going to make this sh this shift in expenditures in favour of trying to help the young. So I think, by all means, let's introduce a levy in which people then pay, and we can use that to improve social care. But I don't believe in stories that say you don't have to pay any more taxes, and we'll find a way to improve it anyway, and we'll even make it free. I think that's pie in the sky. Um, when it comes to health, you know as well as I do that every expert since Adam was a lad has said it's much more uh, cost effective to spend on public health and preventative measures than it is to, uh, to spend on critical health care when, you know, when you're already at death's door. Uh, and Everybody knows that's true, and it's very, very difficult politically to, to, to actually do it because, you know, it's like boiling the frog. You don't notice that you're getting fatter and you're not doing so well, but when your beloved elderly relative is stranded on a, on a lorry, in a, uh, on lorry, sorry, in a trolley in a, in a hospital uh, corridor, you know all about it and you really don't like it and you're going to scream and shout quite reasonably. So it's just the, the, this makes it politically extremely difficult for governments to reorientate spending in a preventative direction as opposed to making sure that the critical care is there. Um, I don't know what the answer is to that. You know, I don't pretend to have an answer, but clearly that's the direction that we should be moving in uh, if there's a way, if, if a way can be found to do it. I mean, it requires a lot of persuasion and uh, no politician is keen to take it on, but I think... Uh, it's the, it's the direction which every expert, in which I'm not, by the way, which every expert says we should go. You know, more spending on preventative measures, public health, monitoring, and then we might be able to save money on, on the critical care. Okay, uh, thank you. We've got, we've got the results of the poll for everybody. Yes, we did ask you to choose just one. We just say it was going to be brutal. Um, Andy is going to share the results uh, right now. Most people, I gather, have, have voted. So let's just have a look at these. Um, so your top, your top suggestion is around uh, second homes being taxed more, more heavily. I'm not sure why that's in red rather than in, than in green. Uh, Andy, do you know why? Um, and next up is Welsh tertiary education should be free for people who work in uh, Wales five years after graduation. Um, uh, what else have we got going on in terms of, so more in education and training and if we can't meet the aspirations for health and social care in third, in third position um, and coming up behind uh, technical education opportunities and then the last three are all, are all um, uh, traipsing along at 5%. Paying teachers more, not popular in today's, in today's audience, and property transaction tax away for first-time buyers, also not popular, and student debt commuted. I see the, um, there's an interesting suggestion that we should run this again 
um, with young people and compare their results to the poll. We'll have a think about whether we can whether we can do that. Jerry, any reflections on on those? I mean, if you were going to if you were going to do that that first one in terms of second homes, you've talked about uh, Welsh government just legislating on it. What else? You know, what else would need to be fleshed out to make that actually happen? <coughs> I'd have to dip into my pocket to support my place in Penarth. <laughs> but but um, <clears throat> yeah, um, I think these I think these answers do reflect the political problem. You know, it's uh, people don't want to face the fact that spending a lot more education and training would possibly impact on our ability to spend on health and social care, uh, and they don't want to be asked to make a contributory. You know, contribution in order to make social care uh, uh, sort of better. So I understand that, and I think that is there is the political problem. You know, we are not facing a situation where there's a there's a trick that enables us to do the right thing without uh, without any pain. And um, uh, and I think you know, people even when they come to the view that we have to take a bit of pain, it maybe takes them a little bit of time to get used to the idea. Um, I wonder. I wonder if we might try and run this again on, on Twitter and see what see what happens with people. Um, we're going to go to we're going to go to some questions from the audience. I'm coming to Hannah first. Hannah Watkin recently won our Young Writers contribution, and she's joined our IWA editorial group um, for a year. So we're really pleased to have you with us, Hannah. Thank you. And you've got a question about career opportunities for Jerry. So hopefully the spotlight will come to you next. As soon as you start talking, Hannah, do you want to ask your question? You may be muted, so we'll find you and unmute you. I can see you there. Andy, could you unmute Hannah, please? Okay, there Thanks, we are. Andy. Um, yes, um, on the subject of um, student debt being waivered if students were to be able to stay in Wales for, say, five years to do, um, to begin their career here. Um, I wanted to bring up the point of um, making sure if this was to be a policy that was followed, um, the opportunities in Wales for young people beginning their careers would have to make sure these opportunities were the best in the United Kingdom or equal to the opportunities elsewhere. Um, because the financial incentive of having student debt wavered in the way that you suggest would certainly be something that young people in Wales, I think, would take these opportunities and make the decision to stay in Wales, um, but would have to be really careful um, that the opportunities that they were offered in doing that were not actually then at a lower standard in any way in the career sectors of their choice than had they left and gone elsewhere. Um, not to suggest that Wales doesn't have the excellent opportunities in career sectors, um, but just as a, as a concern, um, if they were, if for any reason to go into a career um, opportunity, which was of a lesser standard potentially than what they could have had if they'd gone elsewhere, they would then later on in life perhaps still end up at a disadvantage um, for having taken those opportunities. And so I'm thinking sort of, it's important to um, focus on having the um, student debt policy um, to work alongside having hand in hand, making sure that opportunities for young people are just as good um, or else we could still have a negative kind of um, balance going ahead for young people in Wales. Anna, thank you. Jerry, what's your response? Um, well, I think we have to do the best we can, but when you say making sure, I mean, the harsh fact is we can't make sure. Uh, at the end of the day, young people will have their own interests at heart and they'll have to make a decision. And if they think, well, I'd like to have the, my debt waived, but actually the opportunities are better in Harlow or Hounslow than they are in uh, you know, they in Pont Stickel, then, um, you know, they'll go and we'll have to accept that. It, uh, this is going to be a free choice. It's an incentive to people and the hope that they will respond to that incentive because there's enough here uh, to enable them to do so. But there's no way that the Welsh government has got it within its power 
to guarantee to them that, that, that the opportunities here will be as good as anywhere else. Certainly anything it can do to try and make that the case, it should do, I, I agree with you. But you know, we have to be realistic that they can't guarantee it. And at the end of the day, the young person will have to make their own call on that, on that calculation of whether, whether it's worth it or, or not. You know? um, I, I'm encouraged in this by the experience of the Irish Republic. Um, you know, I'm old enough to remember the Irish Republic before it was the fashionable Celtic tiger. And back in the 1970s, they, um, they had a government, the Lynch government. I was working for the OECD in Paris at the time. And the Lynch government decided it was going to have a Keynesian expansion, it was going to borrow a lot of money and spend a lot of money. And we looked at it and said, these guys are mad. You know, this is a tiny, tiny open economy. And if you do that in a tiny open economy, you don't expand anything. All that happens is your balance of payments goes south. And uh, so we said to them, don't do it. They did it anyway. And we were right and we were wrong because the macroeconomic consequences were exactly what we said. But what they spent the money on was education. And that is why in the early 2000s, there were 45% of the Irish population that had tertiary education when the number in the UK was 25%. And you know, it didn't stop migration. Uh, for years and years, I, Irish continued to leave to find jobs elsewhere. But as soon as the economy picked up, there was a huge reflow of these highly trained people. And, it, and Ireland has become a go-to place, particularly for American for foreign investment, because they know there are English speaking, highly educated young people there in, in numbers. And so, you know, it took a long time. I'm talking about the 1970s. And, when did it click? What, 2000 or something? So this isn't a quick fix, but you know, we've got to do this and, and, uh, and hope that you know, over the next 30 years, it'll bear fruit, because that's the sort of time horizon we're looking at. Thanks, Jerry. OK, and we're going to question to Ellie Harwood next, and then Daniel Roberts after that. So Ellie, over to you. Hi, um, I work for Child Poverty Action Group and um, do a lot of work uh, with obviously children in poverty but also their families. I've just been looking um, at the latest households below average income data for Wales um, and things are really grim for um, families with children in Wales and I think when we're talking about young people it's often the case that people start their families and obviously we're talking you know about having um, an aging population and we have got a declining birth rate most people do become parents the average age for a first-time mother is 30 so you know most women do have their children before the age of 40 um, and there's a real challenge there all the things that you've brought up around you know being able to earn a decent living afford a home buy your own home um, and I know in other countries where they're facing a similar kind of demographic change that occasionally governments will choose to incentivize people to have more children and to make a more family friendly society and this can include making payments to families for, for each child we, we currently have a social security system that actually penalizes families for having more than two children if they need state support so I'm um, I'm just sort of interested really in um, whether you think this is something that Wales should consider in terms of, of um, becoming a more family friendly society taking off some of the cost burdens of raising children or you know making payments to families I know Ireland have done this in the past as well you actually would get a higher rate of child benefit for your, for your third fourth fifth child um, and of course we're in a very different paradigm here but is this something that perhaps we might need to think about in the future I'd just be really interested to hear what you have to think about it um, well I'm certainly in favor of making it easier for for young uh, families with things like um, nursery care and um, sure start uh, centers and things of that sort. I think it's very hard to justify encouraging people to have very large families if we're worried about you know the the uh, the ecology and 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 the whole the whole green the whole the whole green crisis if you like. Um, it's difficult to be telling other countries that look, you, know, you have to restrain population growth if we are, uh, we're busily encouraging our own people to, you know, to breed in very large numbers. I do think that, 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 that the globe is approaching its, um, its carrying capacity and 
as good global citizens, I, I, I'm not comfortable with the idea of saying, why don't we all have three, four, five kids? Um, I think we have to try and, I'm, I'm aware there's a slight um, uh, inconsistency, shall I say, in my position in that I'm saying we won't have more kids, we'll just pinch other people's kids and bring them here. You can uh, you can point that finger at me, but I no, I'm just a little uncomfortable about about this into a fertility policy. I, I don't uh, I don't know how I'd square that with um, with the belief that we, uh, we've got to worry about the environment. Uh, so I think um, at, a, at a global level, of course, there's more room in Wales, but you know uh, what sort of an example does it set? So I would prefer to 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 uh, to try and help people to have the number of children to support and educate well the number of children they want. I don't particularly want to encourage them to have more children than it occurs to them to have. Okay, thank you. Uh, Daniel Roberts about entrepreneurship. Dan, where are you? Brilliant. Over to you. Hello, can you hear me? Yep. Cool. Yeah, so I'm uh, Daniel Roberts. I'm a PhD student at Swansea University. Um, and I've been researching attitudes towards, uh, well, the, the attitudes that Welsh students have towards engaging in entrepreneurship uh, in Wales specifically. Um, and I found that for many of these Welsh students uh, inside Wales and outside Wales, there's often a negative perception. And uh, this is especially true for students or potential entrepreneurs in high tech industries. Um, and looking at the policy we've had in this area, it, it's clear that we've been trying to make entrepreneurs, we've been trying to make young people more entrepreneurial in Wales but this might actually be contributing to the to the brain growing further by making these students think that if you want to become an entrepreneur you have to leave Wales to do that um so yeah just it would be really interesting to get your thoughts on you know how do we overcome these informal institutions these perceptions of Wales that people have uh, of it being a lovely place to live and you can live a quiet life in the hills but it's not somewhere where you can get you know these high-tech industries starting in and are these perceptions and institutions almost as important as the, the you know, the real life policy impact that can be had uh, by the Welsh government? Right. I mean, interesting question. I, I do think it, it is a matter of, of, um, of perception. There isn't any fundamental reason why you can't uh, start a high tech business in Wales. In fact, there are high tech businesses in Wales and quite successful ones. Um, you know we're we're possibly going to be leading in in some of the some of the marine based energy um, uh, generation areas. Um, there are some sm relatively small companies in Wales in that area looking very interesting. We've got a number of of young firms that are being very successful in the software area, particularly in the cyber security area. Um, so there are clusters in Wales, and we have you know some interesting firms in the pharmaceutical area or the medical appliances area so there are these there are these potentials sort of clusters um i don't think there's any reason to think that 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 wales couldn't be uh, um a center for entrepreneurship it has been at various times in the past we we had the first people to start a mail order business i mean how how fashionable is that you know <laughs> the very first one was it founded in newtown in 18 something or other so uh there is a history of Welsh entrepreneurship as well as uh, as a suspicion of it, um, and uh, I think how do we how do we crack the perception? Um, I'm not sure. Do you think an advertising campaign or, or something of that sort would uh, would do any good? Is it, it? Can we just if we just publicise some of the some of the opportunities? Would that help? Because it doesn't seem to me there's any reality there in the sense of you know you can't you can't make a business in Wales, and you would think. With the move to the digital economy, then then location is supposed to become slightly less important anyway. So you know, I I think this is a perception we have to try and overcome. We've got um, I've, we've gone over our hour, but I'm going to I'm going to carry on because I've got two more questions I want to um, I want to go to uh, Jerry, if that's all right with you. We've got a question here from Robin Lovelock, and then one from Karen Delarmi, please. So Robin, I hope you're still around. I can see you, so hopefully somebody on the team will unmute you now. There we go. 
thank you um, and good evening everybody I uh, really appreciate the discussion uh, so far I think it's a really important topic uh, and, and particularly interesting to hear about the experiences in the Irish context uh, so thank you for that I was I was wondering more generally uh, to what extent the the policy proposals that you've made uh, are based on examples from elsewhere or or kind of um, meta studies of evidence um, that have been gathered um, and and whether there is evidence to show that um, that the, those kind of policies do lead to retention of young people or wider um, wider benefits for prosperity. Um, my, my, my interest is uh, I work with the, the North Wales Economic Ambition Board uh, and so we're looking at, uh, at really how to support some of, uh, of these you know, progress on some of these issues uh, for the North Wales region which being a particularly rural region for the large part of it um, you know particularly in the west uh, really do struggle um, and so I do wonder whether some of it could be addressed at a um, at a regional level as well uh, obviously not um, maybe around taxation but uh, certainly around supporting entrepreneurship and links to industry and those kind of things thank you, well, thank you. I, I, no I, I certainly do think that the notion that if you're going to have a structure to help young entrepreneurs it has to be pretty granular you know you're not dealing with uh, Amazon or something you're dealing with you know somebody who's just starting up and hasn't got much money and and need somebody local who understands local conditions as well as perhaps the business that they want to be engaged in and can and can and can mentor them at that level and the sums of money they need would be pretty small in most cases so again they could be managed by a fund which had which had regional um, or local centers so I do think that we're talking about startups and a very a very granular level of support um, and I think that could be and indeed should be done through through local or regional structures within Wales. Um, do we know it's going to work? Um, it's difficult to say. I mean it, I found it interesting that um, that Germany um, where the the Pfizer vaccine was uh, was developed in fact although uh, Pfizer bought it from the small company that had made it. The small company was a couple of children, I think, of Turkish immigrants. And so, um, you know, that's a very clear case. I mean, it's an anecdote, not a, not uh, not proper scientific evidence, but you know, it, it's often the case that uh, the people who come into a place uh, are energetic and do things that the locals doesn't occur to the locals to do. So I think. Uh, I think if we can not only keep our own young people, but bring keep young people who come in for you know for, in order to study, that can only help. Thank you, Karen. We're going to come to you next, please, Karen Delami. Hopefully, uh, there we go. Yeah, there we go. Unmuted. Thank you very much. Evening, everybody. Um, yeah, I was just wondering whether there was a possibility, um, Jerry, to sort of tailor the education offer. Now we've got the new curriculum for Wales coming out around the Welsh economy growth sectors or sectors that we can identify have got potential for strong growth. So, you know, it could be at a macro level, it could be right the way down to a very micro le level in terms of sort of community focused schools and getting kind of, you know, all the stakeholders in an area, local area. Um, to, to wrap around those children and young people, sort of real multi-agency approach, um, you know, particularly in the areas of, of higher poverty, um, you know, one of the schools that I represent. Um, you know, we could be thinking about things like you've already mentioned, some of the more sustainable green uh, jobs, that might be a sector that we could explore. Um, I don't know, but I think there's, there's a few possibilities there. Well, I agree, and I, I think it's particularly true of um, uh, further education and vocational training as well. Um, you know, I, I was reading various um, proposals put forward by Community Housing Cymru and others uh, for how you could help the green, uh, the green developments by, for example, insulating all our houses. They would say, oh, this is only going to cost a couple of billion, and um, you know, it's going to provide 26,000 jobs. And I thought, 26,000 jobs, there are 70,000 people unemployed in Wales at the moment. Most of them have come out of the retail or the hospitality sector, and they'll probably go back in. If you'd offered 26,000 jobs in Wales 
two years ago, I will bet you dollars to donuts that most of them would have been filled by people from Poland and Romania who knew how to insulate a house and had building skills already, you know. Now we've closed the door to those guys. So if we're going to, if we're going to create 26,000 jobs, we are going to have to do the things you say. We have to make sure that the training is in place, that there's adequate pay and that the incentives are there for people to take this up. If, if you started spending this money right now, you, know, you wouldn't employ many Welsh people, you'd import the workers. So it's, it's, it's absolutely essential that we, if we start to have these very big public expenditure uh, um, programs for green development that we start at the right end and set and say, you know, have we got the supply side right? Have we got the people? Have they got the training? Have they got the incentives? How do we put those things right before we start throwing money at the wall? Because it won't stick. And on that note, we are going to wrap up, I think, everybody. Thank you very much indeed. There's a very good provocation to end with. We've got a very quick do poll for you now. Um, very quick two question survey to feedback on today's events. Very sorry about the tech hitch in the middle, but we got we got through it. Um, we'd like your thoughts, please, on on what if any of these we might we might work on next as we think about ways in which we can contribute beyond our existing portfolio of policy and project work to uh, furthering debate and discussion and action on, on the issues that uh, we've been talking about this evening. And obviously on the cusp of uh, the next election to the Senate in, uh, what is it, four weeks on Thursday, um, we are hoping for a really good turnout amongst new first time voters as well, as well as foreign nationals who are allowed to vote here for the first time too. Thank you very much indeed to everybody who's come this evening. If you're not already a member of the IWA, my question is why not? Um, and do join us. Um, membership counts for about a third of our income and we're really very grateful to each and every one of you who is a member. You do help make events like this happen and you help us contribute to making Wales better by upping the game on the quality of public debate on issues that really matter. My thanks also, Jerry, very much indeed to you for, for today and for the provocation that you have given now and over the previous 19 and a quarter years um, and no doubt will continue to, to give uh, into the future. It's been, it's been a pleasure and we look forward to looping you into lots of other conversations in the future. So thank you very much indeed. Jeff. Pleasure is entirely mine. Thank you very much. Thank you and good night everybody. <laughs>